Glasgow, which has been host to them for nearly a fortnight, the last American survivors of the Athena disaster set sail across the Atlantic under the American flag. Many of them have lost all their possessions. Many are still wearing clothes that friends have lent or given to them. But for the children, it's still a great adventure. Little do they know how they pass through the shadow of death. The liner Orizaba shows the American flag on her sides and decks, and at night she'll be floodlit. So if any more German submarines are knocking around, they'd better watch out. Meanwhile, the first batch of survivors arrives at Halifax, Nova Scotia. The American freighter City of Flint picked them out of the sea and then continued on her journey across the Atlantic. Normally, she has accommodation for just six passengers. Now she carries 223. But in spite of endless discomfort, shortage of food and clothing, in spite of nightmare memories of the submarine terror, how happy they are to see the new world. And to America they bring eyewitness stories of confusion and darkness. And many clearly saw the pirate submarine. Listen to William Stewart, a Scotch-Canadian. We saw the submarine to our left at a distance of about 200 yards. We saw it for a considerable time. There's no doubt about being a submarine. I've seen many submarines before. And Germany is still saying that Mr. Churchill sunk the Athena himself. And here's W.C. Bond of Illinois. I saw, I saw the uh, boat rise to the surface and fire a shell and hit the boat after, after the torpedo struck the boat. And then later on it fired another torpedo which went within 10 feet of our boat, but it, it didn't strike the Athena, it exploded in the water. Imagine being part of a monumental moment in history and not remembering much of anything about it. And your best clue is 200 meters below the surface of the North Atlantic. This is a sonar image of what's believed to be the wreck of the SS Athenia. And what a tale she has to tell, if only she could tell it. Heather Watts was almost three years old back in September of 1939. Eighty years later, she craves any bit of information about her fateful voyage into history aboard the Athenia. Uh, mother had never seen you. That's your mother? And, um, this old recording of Heather's mother giving her account of a harrowing night on the ocean liner is Heather's most treasured link to her part in the first day of World War II. The Prime Minister spoke over the, over the radio and we heard that war had been declared. War is what the Athenia passengers, mostly women and children, were desperately fleeing. Little did they know they were sailing right into it. Off the coast of Scotland, an overly zealous German U-boat captain had spied the Athenia and against all rules, fired his torpedoes. And I was telling you your bedtime story when the crash came. And it was just an almighty jolt. And equally jarring, the cruelty of war. Margaret Hayworth of Hamilton was fatally wounded in the attack. At age 10, she would become the first casualty of World War II to be buried in Canada. I just thought this was the end and we were drowning. But Heather's mother somehow managed to keep her safe. With the ship listing, the surviving passengers scrambled into unstable, leaky lifeboats. So I was thrown onto the floor with, with you underneath me. And, uh, and you were crying out. All I can remember was just oily water um, and, and not getting my breath for a few minutes because they, I'd fallen into the chains and stuff in the bottom of the boat, you see. And then 11 agonizing hours on the darkened North Atlantic. More than 100 would not survive. It was quite a night. It was indeed. It's these things that, you know, knowing what the experience was, you can find out even more and about of the other people that were on that boat and what their experiences were. And why is that so important to you? 
just because it's part of my life and I, it was a very unusual and dramatic experience. It's that quest to know more that's leading Heather to Halifax, where eight other child survivors will be together again for the first time in 80 years. People like Philip Gunyon, who was seven at the time. Now, all these years later, he considers himself one of the lucky ones. Uh, yeah, I think about the people who lost their lives. And that's one of the things I want to acknowledge today is the ones that couldn't be here. And uh, sure, you think about, yeah, maybe it could have been me, but it wasn't, so you just live with that. And people like Vivian Culver, she was three at the time of the sinking, and even today, her sole memory of being in a lifeboat brings her anxiety. So where is this coming from? And the only thing I could pin it to was probably this repressed memory of not just sitting in the lifeboat, but the fear that I must have felt that emanated from the people that were there. I want to thank you all for making this trip. They're here to commemorate the disaster, to honor the dead, and feel the bond that only survivors can feel. Whereas you've lived through it. Together, once again, to perhaps in some way process their unlikely involvement in those first hours of World War II. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax.